see everyone today out there in the virtual world. We want to welcome you to today's worship service and particularly we want to say happy Mother's Day to all those moms out there and grandmothers uh, who are uh, celebrating here today in a little bit of a different fashion than what we're used to but hopefully you're able to find a way to uh, to connect with your family today, uh, those you love and even if mom's not around there's a way hopefully you can connect with those who mean so much to you or maybe even have acted as a mother in many ways to you and, and share your appreciation. Uh, still, though, today is the day we come together uh, to, to simply honor our Lord, uh, to thank Him for all the gifts that He has given us, all that He has done for us, and we look forward to sharing in this time together with you, as always, uh, today. Just want to remind you all uh, that if, if we really want to encourage you that uh, you would interact with the service there online. If there's anything that you find particularly that resonates with you during the service, uh, feel free to, to, uh, to share that uh, in the, the comment section on the video. We love to see that interaction. It's a great way for us in this sort of environment we're in 
uh, to be able to share with each other and connect with each other and, uh, and give some sort of sense of being present in this moment together. And so we encourage you to interact uh, in that way. Also, I just want to encourage you at the same time, later in our service, as always, there will be a time where we observe uh, the Lord's Supper. Uh, just take what emblems that you have available to you there in your home. Maybe it's a loaf of bread. Uh, maybe it's a thing of apple juice or maybe it's just water. Whatever it may be that you have available to you, uh, the, what matters the most is that we uh, remember the sacrifice of our Savior and, and His body and, and blood that were broken and shed for us. And so whatever you can take to be a part of that, we encourage you to utilize those things and prepare those things now for use later in the service so that we can share in that moment together. Right now, we want to go ahead and go to our Lord in prayer and simply ask for His blessing as we continue in this time of worship. So let's go ahead and let's, uh, let's go before Him and lift our hearts up to Him in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank You so much that we had the opportunity once again to be here gathered together uh, in this virtual space, uh, to be able to lift up Your name on high. Lord, You are worthy of our praise. You are awesome and mighty and powerful, Lord. And uh, we are so thankful that today, in this moment, we are not alone. The Lord, you are with us, uh, that you are with us in this time. And even in a virtual means, Lord, that doesn't hold you back. That doesn't limit you, Lord. You are present everywhere anyway. And so, Lord, we, we just simply uh, now take this time to focus on your presence. And it's our prayer that everything that's on our minds today, and I know there's so much on our minds, so much on our minds. Uh, Lord, may we just take this time to take those things on our minds and, and set them before you. Lord, and, and just set them before your throne and say, God, give me guidance today. Uh, give me guidance in this hour. Give me, uh, give me wisdom in this hour. Teach me, Lord, or help me to understand what I need to do with these things. Uh, and, and let us just submit those things before your throne right now, Lord as we enter into this time of worship, to honor you and glorify you. We love you, Father, and we give you the praise and glory in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen.
Christ, our solid rock. From the Psalm, chapter 40. I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and he heard my cry. He lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and the mire. He set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. He put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see and fear the Lord and put their trust in him. become his righteousness he humbled himself and carried the cross love so amazing love so Amen. 
morning, church. Uh, this week, uh, Wayne and I were actually talking about how um, we kind of find it interesting that companies still send out paper catalogs uh, with lists of things you can get because most people just order their stuff online. And it actually got me to thinking about uh, when I was younger, uh, I would get near Christmas, I would get the catalog I'd been waiting for all, all year long, which was the Lego catalog. Uh, it had uh, all these Lego sets um, of all these cool things you could build, and I remember going through there and circling every Lego set that I liked so I could give it to my parents so that they could uh, know what to get me for Christmas, you know, know the set that I wanted. Um, and I absolutely loved uh, Legos. Uh, I, right now, Amber and I are watching the TV show Lego Masters, where they, they build all these interesting things that I could never build. Uh, one day, I hope to go to Legoland so I can see all those cool things, too. Uh, but kind of connected to that, something I didn't necessarily get into is uh, scale models of you know, cars and jets and all these cool things you can build. Um, but I, I have students that really enjoy doing modeling, and I, my, I've known people that really have these intricate models. And the cool thing about these scale models is it allows us to take something that's really big and make it small. But for it to be a scale model, we have to actually have it, it, it can't just be the outside. You know, the real good models are, you know, the car that you can open up and it's got what the engine looked like and you can open up the doors and see the dash and everything in there, just the actual down to each, each little detail. Um, one model that I've always wanted to build from Legos is the Death Star. Uh, it's like three or four hundred dollars, so if you all want to start a GoFundMe, I won't stop you. <laughs> Uh, but, it, you know, but what's cool is it's not just a ball, because uh, that would be semi-easy to make with Lego. They actually have a little section cut out where you can have all the little intricacies of the computers and people doing stuff inside, and that's what makes it. And the Bible actually has some examples of, of models so we can kind of recreate stuff that happened. Like, we actually can recreate exactly what the tab tabernacle would have looked like because we have the measurements, we have what they used, so on and so forth. Um, same thing with the temple. We have detailed instructions of how the temple was supposed to look. God, God very many times provides those instructions. And just like you can't just pick up the pieces of a model car and put it together without instructions, or Legos, unless you're a Lego master, uh, you can't just take the set and be like, oh, I know how this works. You have to have the instructions. And so God is very big on giving these instructions. And a model that we have uh, that Jesus was big on, he, he gives us the model prayer. But the thing that we, we remember during this time is the model of communion. The, the model that Jesus set before he would go to the cross so that we could remember the sacrifice he was about to make. And this model, just like the little intricate details of a model car or a Lego set, has those intricate details. We have the, the juice to remember his blood, that, that precious gift that he spilled out in abundance uh, for us. And, and, and so it's important to remember that's what the juice is, or the liquid, as today may make us do. And then we have the bread, that was broken for us. To think about his body that was pierced for us, that was beaten for us, it's all modeling a greater sacrifice. We don't have to recreate the crucifixion of Christ over and over again. We can, in a very small model, represent that. And it's the small details that are important. And so this morning, as you take your, your juice and you take your bread, remember, what they represent, the bigger picture, the bigger thing, the model, if you'll pray with me. Heavenly Father, we love you so much. We are so thankful that you sent your son to die on the cross for us. We are so thankful for that sacrifice. It's a sacrifice that we couldn't imagine and we couldn't recreate. Uh, we, we have nothing that could have ever, ever, ever got close to what was needed to be paid for us to be forgiven of our sins, but you did. 
and you sent your son to die on the cross to spill his blood for his body to be pierced and beaten for us. And that's a sacrifice that we, we, we can't even come close to, to realizing how great it was. But we thank you so much. We thank you for the promise we now have that one day we can be in heaven with you and be in paradise. And we won't have to remember what you've done. We'll, we'll be able to see it every day. We pray that you move our hearts during this time and let us focus on you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Well, good morning again. It's good to, uh, again, be able to join everyone here. My name, by the way, is Nick Skinner. If you're joining us on this feed today and you've not been a part of our live online service, I'm the senior minister here at Northside. And uh, so we're very grateful to have you uh, joining us. At this time is typically the time that we just give a moment just to talk, spirit, or to talk specifically about uh, the ability we have uh, to continue in the grace of giving and uh, to be able to be generous uh, toward the work going on here, and of course, just the, really be generous to the Lord. After all, as we just celebrated, He's been so generous to us. And so we just want to simply uh, mention this, uh, encourage you all to check out our website as a means of uh, financial generosity. Check out our website, uh, nschristianchurch.org, and there's a donate tab up there. And if you go there, uh, you can uh, uh, set up online giving that way. 
uh, just a one-time gift or a regular gift, a recurring gift. Uh, you can also uh, submit your donation to us through the good old U.S. Postal Service. Uh, and you, please send that to our P.O. Box, P.O. Box 1344, Georgetown, Kentucky, 40324. And if you would do that, uh, we would be very, very appreciative of that. And so many of you have, and it's awesome. To be honest, you talk about the spirit of generosity. Again, I continue just to see different examples in our fellowship of how the spirit of generosity is just poured out time and time again, not just in a financial means, but in, a, in, a, in just a, a giving means. Uh, so many you know, gifts dropped off at the doorstep, uh, different uh, phone calls and and uh, notes of encouragement sent through the mail, all these different means in, by which we are being generous toward others uh, and uh, encouraging one another through this time. And uh, just so encouraged by that and encourage us. I, I don't know if I can use the word encourage anymore, but I will to encourage us uh, to just continue to keep uh, doing that and uh, being an encouragement to one another. Uh, someone somewhere right now is counting the number of times I've thus far said encouragement and will do for the remainder of this service, I'm sure. Uh, <laughs> some of us just have those words we come back to, right? Uh, anyway, so we're thankful uh, for so many things. I'd like to start today by sharing with you what I'm going to call Murphy's Law of Church Attendance. Murphy's Law or Laws for Church Attendance. Law number one is this. If the weather is extremely bad, church attendance will be down. Law number two, if the weather is extremely good, church attendance will be down. Law number three, if you're short on your supply of bulletins, attendance will exceed expectations. Uh, So (laughs) hopefully that gives you a little bit of a chuckle there. It did us in this room here this morning. Earlier this week, I was reading the most recent edition of the Christian Standard. I don't know if you're familiar with the Christian Standard or not. Uh, in, if you were, when, in the days when we were attending in person, if you were to walk through our lobby, you would see on a, on a table there to your left uh, a stack of, of magazines, and those were the Christian Standards. I know some of you read those. Maybe some of you weren't familiar with them. Uh, but uh, we get these magazines every month. We have a subscription here to them. And I was reading an article from uh, one of the, the most recent edition of the Christian Standard here uh, just earlier this week. And before I share that article, I do want to say, if you're at the point where you've been like self-quarantining at home or staying healthy at home, as we say, and you know, you're running out of reading material and you'd love, we still got last month's Christian Standard and I think even some from the month before that. Uh, we would love to be able to, to get some of those into your hands and stuff so they're going to good use. So if you would uh, like to have some of that extra reading material, just kind of send us a private message, not in the feed here, but if you'd send us a private message to the church uh, Facebook page and you live local, <laughs> uh, we would be glad to uh, try to get those Christian standards to you so they go to good use. But there was an article in, in this most recent edition of the Christian Standard that was written by the publisher, Jerry Harris, And I want to share a little bit of what I read in his article with you today, because I think it's a great way for us to talk about what we're going to be talking about today. Here's what he wrote. An American cultural phenomenon hit in late 2019. Kanye West released a gospel album and simultaneously declared that he was dedicating himself to spreading the gospel message. The album, whose name was G or which name was Jesus is King debuted at number one on the Billboard chart in its first week and was streamed more than 200 million times and sold 109,000 copies. People, of course, were immediately skeptical, both of the music and the artist. There was no, no, short, short, there was no shortage of judgment upon West from the Christian community. The album includes some incredible worship songs, but one stood out, Harris writes particularly because it addresses a disturbing trend within the church that leaders are trying to understand. Now, before I share the name of the song, I want you to keep in mind that this article was written pre-coronavirus, okay? So much of the stuff I'm referencing here is is pre-coronavirus, the days in which we were attending, again, services in person. But he says one of these songs stands out because it particularly addressed a disturbing trend within the church that leaders were trying to understand and are trying to understand. The name of the song is Closed on Sunday. And the the whole premise of the song is that it describes a commitment to weekly church services. Through his lyrics, Kanye West, of all people, 
indicates that being with the church family regularly is critical not only to his own life, but to his marriage and his family. That song closed on Sunday is a declaration that he will stand against the culture by making his faith his first priority because he knows what is at stake. And so the the question that Harris asked then as a follow-up to that is, how is it that Kanye West understands what many others seem to struggle with? He goes on to share the following. Those who measure attendance are finding that churches are growing larger and smaller at the same time. How is that even possible? It's an interesting question, an interesting issue. The answer, he says, lies in the frequency of attendance. Statistically, before coronavirus came about, again, we were meeting in person, the average church attendee attended church anywhere between 1.2 times a month and 1.6 times a month. Obviously, those are averages. One point between 1.2 and 1.6 times a month. That's the attendance of the average church member in America. And what that means is that a church with with an average weekly attendance of 500 could actually be ministering to more than 1,500 people in a month's time. Now, Now, what's interesting about, there's a lot that's interesting about these statistics, honestly. But what I find really interesting about these is when you kind of put them in perspective of our current time and where we are today, Uh, If that was the reality, and it was the reality, that's the statistical reality that people were on average attending church 1.2 to 1.6 times per month. Uh, I think that's a really interesting sort of juxtaposition uh, compared to where we are today. I know a lot of stuff we have going on presently. You know, I know all about, you know, we had the judge ruling uh, here in Kentucky here just recently about uh, basically overturning the governor's decision about with churches. And there are a lot of people that what's underneath all of that is a lot of people who were incensed in many ways that uh, from the very get-go, the government uh, said that uh, churches were a non-essential business and treated churches as a non-essential business. And a lot of people have been up in arms about that. A lot of people have been very, uh, have very strong opinions about that, particularly you know, from the church perspective. But here's my pushback to that today. How can we blame the government when before all this came about, most of us didn't see the church as essential? If we were being honest (laughs) about our own selves, was the church really essential before coronavirus came about? I think there's a moment for us to take a little bit of humility there and say, how can we blame the government for buying what we've been selling all along? There's a lot of soul searching I think we have to do in that regard. Our actions have reflected that church isn't essential to us. Here's the question that Harris follows up with. Is that okay? Do we need our church family less than we we used to? How does that affect our life? And more importantly, what does God think about it? What I find... Again, worth noting is this. How many times prior to coronavirus would we go one month, two months, miss, without church and not even bat an eye at it? And now, though, there's a little bit of a shift in the way it feels because now that we're told in a manner of speaking we can't attend, now all of a sudden we feel that one to two months a little bit differently It feels as though we've lost something significant, and I wonder if it's perhaps this feeling that we've lost something that we were taking for granted for a long time. These last two months of mandated separation feel different than those two months of self-imposed separation. Now, I want to be honest. This is not to shame anybody, okay? We don't deal, I don't want to deal with shame here, and if it's coming across that way, then then I'm sorry, and I'll, I'll, I'll apologize for that. This is not to shame anybody. And it's not to neglect the fact at the same time that there are many people who do faithfully show up. And as a matter of fact, not only when we were meeting in person, but man, there are so many of you, you're, you're faithful to show up on this virtual uh, cat, uh, webcast every time we do it for these many weeks that we have been doing it now. And I don't want to neglect that, and I don't want to overlook that. The point of sharing all this is to get us to think critically about whether our life is where we want it to be and is, is it where God wants it to be. Now that the significance of our fellowship is at the forefront of our minds, now that it is something that we really acutely feel and and see and experience every week, we we miss 
that being together. Now that we have this opportunity, I think it's important for us to talk as a fellowship about why it's important, why this meeting together and, and why it truly matters, not just to our spiritual well-being, but to our physical, our mental, and our emotional well-being. That this is a critical part of what God has called us to. So we're going to spend the next four weeks examining four critical practices of our faith that are incomplete. They're incomplete without the presence of other believers in our lives. Four practices of our faith that, God, that Jesus and God came out and, and, and said, here, this is a part of, of following me. This is a part of, of being one of my followers. And when you look through Scripture, you find that it, it's something that without the presence of other believers, we can never practice it in, in the fullest extent to which God intended. And so we're going to look at these four critical practices over the next four weeks. As we begin with our first today, I want to share this story with you. A few years ago, of course, I was in my, my ministry in Lexington, and we were planning at this time, this was many years ago, we were planning for a big event. And I can't even remember what it was that I was planning for. I, can't, I know that one of the, the, the uh, issue at hand was set up of the room where we were trying to pre- prepare for this event. And it was something about tables and chairs, I think, and making sure that you know, some of this stuff was all set up the way we needed it to be. And uh, in the church that I was serving at the time, we had a facilities team that would help set those kind of things up and a, a facilities manager who oversaw that team. And so when you wanted to uh, request something, you went to the facilities manager and made the request. And so that's what I did. I, I went to, to uh, him and made a request. And our facilities manager at the time was an older gentleman, uh, a gentleman that uh, I respected and I still greatly respect even today. But have you ever had a conversation with somebody where, you, didn't, you weren't aware of it, but you both just kind of entered the conversation at the wrong time. I mean, like both of you, without really even being aware of it, were kind of primed for like something maybe explosive to happen. And, and one person innocently says one thing and it gets misinterpreted and it triggers you. And because of that, you respond back and you trigger the other person. And before long, this giant mis- misunderstanding has just sort of been an event that has mushroomed before your very eyes. And that's exactly what happened. I didn't like the way he said something to me when I made the request. And so I kind of fired back angrily. And then he fired back angrily at me. And we both left just kind of like, you know, at each other, right? I can get angry at times. But I'll tell you this. I have terrible insecurity when I do. Now, sometimes that's justified. Sometimes it's not. But I, I, I hate being angry at somebody. And as a matter of fact, I, 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 have a, I, am, I hate having someone have, be at odds with me. Uh, I hate having people at odds with me. It, it's a hard feeling for me to wrestle with, and it makes me very uncomfortable. And almost immediately after this interaction happened, I hated it. I mean, I, I was so upset and so uncomfortable, and I was so insecure. It was a simple misunderstanding. And after each of us had a little bit of a time to process, you know, you get a chance to step back and you you kind of process things and you think through it and stuff, you realize, okay, okay, here's where equilibrium is and here's what's true and here's what's not true about this moment. After we had that chance to cool down, we both took a moment to reconcile. And our facilities manager extended that forgiveness to me. And I felt such a wonderful peace that to this day, I will never forget I will never forget the peace I felt in that moment when he spoke the words as I confessed my wrong and he extended and vocalized forgiveness to me. That's the power of confession. The power of confession between especially two believers in Jesus Christ. And that's the first critical practice that we're going to be taking a look at here today. As we look at our faith and we look at these four critical practices, it's a practice, confession is, which in the absence of other believers in our life is incomplete. And maybe you've not thought about it before that way, but I think you will see it that way after we're done this morning. I want you to turn with me in your Bibles this morning to James chapter 5, verse 16. James chapter 5, verse 16. And here's what James has to say there in that scripture. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. And now I want you to turn with me to another scripture. And this scripture is found in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. 
First Timothy chapter 2, verse 5 states this, For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men, the man, Jesus Christ. So what's the significance of these two verses together? Uh, why, why are we pairing them together, and how do they relate to one another? Here's, here's the relationship they have, and here's what they inform us with today about confession. Here it is. The confession is both a private and a corporate practice. Confession is both a private and a corporate practice. Now, when I say the word corporate, that's a word that we can really get lost in, right? Okay, like, are you saying that this is like an institutionalized for-profit business? No. Corporate means it's something that we do with others. It involves others. It's more than just a person. It's something, we, when we talk about something we do corporately, you know, we talk about corporate worship. Wor- corporate worship is when we're together. It involves other people. Uh, and, and confession is something that also in its own way involves other people, not just God. But there is, at the same time, a private part to it. There's a private relationship between us and God. So h- how do we reconcile these things? You know, this is going to take some explanation. Here, here's, here's the beginning of this explanation, okay? We all need, we all need to confess our sins before God. And so there's this aspect of confession that is first and foremost a private conversation between us and God. At the same time, though, the Bible tells us that there's an importance to confessing sin to each other as well. So what is the difference between the two? What is the uniqueness of each? The first conversation brings restoration. The the first conversation, the conversation with God, brings restoration to a relationship. The second conversation, the conversation with the other believers, or those who are those trusted believers who we confess these types of things to, it brings valuable confirmation of that restoration. And we'll get into that a little bit more. I think you'll see the picture a little more clearly. But right now, the Bible clearly states to us that confession is both a private and yet a corporate practice that we're to engage in. And we're a little hesitant to perhaps accept that today, particularly those of us who come from a Protestant background, which is a lot of us. There's a lot of you, though, I know that come from a Catholic background as well, and you're probably a little more comfortable with that kind of concept because of the way that it's, it's practiced in the Catholic Church. But, but for those of us from a Protestant background, it might seem a little bit of a stretch or an uncomfortable type thing. And, and that goes back in history. See, back when the Protestant Reformation happened and Martin Luther and all those guys uh, started kind of bringing Reformation to the church or trying to, one of the things that was going on in the Catholic Church is that the discipline of confession had become something used for manipulation, and instead of being used in a, whole, in a holy way, it was being used in a way that, that was manipulating the people who were doing the confessing. And then there was all this doctrine of penance and all these other things that came in uh, that brought about a, a concept of earning salvation that Luther rejected. And, but when, when he, he uh, rejected it, he didn't reject it all the way, but then his followers would to the extent that they threw the baby out with the bathwater. And they said, you know what? Confession is only something to be done between us and God. There's one mediator between God and men, and it's Jesus Christ. And so that's the only, the only avenue we need to go. And th- certainly there's a truth there that the only means by my salvation is Jesus Christ. But we can't forget this other teaching of Scripture as a matter of fact, sometimes we forget that actually when this was introduced first into the Catholic Church, when the idea of confession to a brother, a confessional system, was introduced into the Catholic Church first, before all the manipulation, do you know what happened in the Catholic Church? It sparked a genuine revival of personal piety and holiness before all that other stuff got in and muddied the water. So we know the value of confessing our sins to God. What then is the value of confessing our sins to to each other or to those whom we trust very intimately with those details of our life. Well, here's what we see, that confession is a life-giving ministry. Confession is a life-giving ministry among the body of Christ. Richard J. Foster, in his book, The Celebration of Discipline, states this. The person, and see if you can identify with this scenario. The person who has known forgiveness and release from the persistent nagging habits of sin through private confession, that confession to God, should rejoice greatly in the evidence of God's mercy. But there are others for whom this has not happened. Let me describe what it's like. Again, see if you can relate. We have prayed, even begged for forgiveness. And though we hope we have been forgiven, we sense no release. We doubt our forgiveness and we despair at our confession. We fear that perhaps we've made confession only to ourselves and not to God. The haunting sorrows and hurts of the past 
have not been healed. We try to convince ourselves that God forgives only the sin and this doesn't forgive the memory or heal the memory. But deep within our being, we know there must be something more. People have told us to take our forgiveness by faith and not call God a liar. Not wanting to call God a liar, we do our best to take it by faith. But because misery and bitterness remain in our lives, we again despair. Eventually, we begin to believe that either forgiveness is only a ticket to heaven and not meant to affect our lives now, or that we're not worthy of the forgiving grace of God. The Book of Common Prayer gives us these encouraging words. If there be any of you who by this means, by the means of simply asking forgiveness to God, cannot quiet his own conscience herein, but require further comfort or counsel, let him come to me or to some other minister of God's word and open his grief. Foster continues in this way. He says this, God has given us our brothers and sisters to stand in Christ's stead and make God's presence and forgiveness real to us. Only a matter of weeks ago, we were celebrating Easter Sunday, remember? We were in John chapter 20, and we were looking at Jesus' post-resurrection appearances to his disciples, and there they were, huddled in behind that locked door. Jesus appears, and he presents himself to them for the first time. And as we were reading that passage, you remember there was a verse that we came across, verse 23, that was very peculiar, where God told his disciples, or Jesus told his disciples this. He said, if you forgive the sins of any, they're forgiven them. But if you withhold forgiveness from many, it's withheld. And we went on and we talked about that verse just a little bit. And we said that in that verse, God isn't sitting there saying that our forgiveness, whether or not my sin is forgiven, is dependent upon whether John or James or Peter says, well, you're worthy of being forgiven. That's not what Jesus' point was there. What Jesus was doing is he was saying, you all are my people. You are my people to be commissioned to go out and proclaim to, to the world what is already a reality that God has, has paid for the forgiveness of sins through Jesus Christ. And, and, and it makes sense when we think about it. Why would, he, why would he have them do that? Because just as you and I encounter this today, so did they encounter it with doubt as well. There are people that, that he knew that there are people that they were going to come to with the gospel message and talk about forgiveness, and they were going to think to themselves, as so many of us do, does it really apply to me? Is it really true for me? I mean, like, you're going to forgive my sin? And so Jesus is saying, give them reassurance. After all, you're the ones who walked with me. Think about this. You're living in doubt. You heard the gospel for the first time. And of all people, it's the Apostle John who comes around you, puts an arm around you and says, yeah, it means you too. Think about how powerful that is to hear that from a man who walked with Jesus. God uses us to confirm to those we love and to others in this world that the forgiveness that he's already made a reality by his sacrifice is real. And that it is a reality for those who have difficulty accepting it for themselves. I already had God's forgiveness when I said to my co-worker that I, when I confessed it to him. But hearing him repeat that I was forgiven brought such peace to my heart. Even hearing forgiveness affirmed by a person who isn't even directly affected by the situation can have a dramatic impact and it brings peace and it breathes life into us. Thirdly, confession is enabled by mercy today. Confession is enabled by mercy. What is it that ultimately draws us to confess our sins to God? You think about that relationship that we have to God. What is it that ultimately draws us to confess our sins to Him? Now, some people might answer that very quickly and say, well, conviction. Conviction is what calls me to confess my sin. I fall under conviction and it, can, I, it calls me to confess my sin to God. But truthfully, there's a question beyond that we need to ask because what is it that motivates our conviction? What is our conviction rooted in? And how do we know that it's in a, in, from a healthy perspective or an unhealthy perspective? Here's how you can tell that you're being motivated to confess sin from an unhealthy perspective. There's a difference. It's in the difference between conviction and compulsion. Compulsion is essentially when we go before God and we confess to something because we're wanting to avoid punishment. It's a fear of really the wrath of God in a sense of, I'm not really interested in changing, but I feel forced. I feel that if I don't do this, God's going to come down with wrath, and it's like, ugh. You know, I just want to get God off my back. 
And, and so we, we, we confess something out of compulsion. There's really no desire to change, just a desire to not get caught. And if that's where we are today, our motivation really isn't conviction, it's compulsion. The healthy motivation stems from love. Conviction is rooted in the love of God. Conviction is what happens when you hear the words of 1 John chapter 4, verse 19. And you realize as you look at your own life that God wants so much more for you. That he is standing actually right now waiting in the wings, ready to give you everything you need to live in the fullness of everything he desires for your life. Here's what John, 1 John chapter 4, verse 19 says. We love because he first loved us. In a healthy mindset, we are drawn to confess to God because we realize that he's a safe place for our heart to be held. To be held bare and open because he wants nothing but the best for us. He loves us. So here's where the rubber meets the road today. All right, We've talked about a lot of things about confession. Let's talk about how do we fulfill this commandment. All right? That our takeaway is simply this. And Scripture, you can't put it any really better than the way Scripture put it in James there. Our takeaway is simply this. Confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. So how do we do this? If you're aching today for a forgiveness, uh, for the release that forgiveness brings, and you've brought it to God time and time again, but there's something that still seems to be missing, some aspect of peace that still, still seems to be absent from your life. The takeaway and, and the action here is step is to find a Christian brother or sister who's not manipulative but merciful. A Christian brother or sister who has empathy and not enmity. A Christian brother or sister who keeps things in the strictest confidence and doesn't share them with salacious con, con, correspondence. Yeah. <laughs> I'll get, sometimes you get tongue tied when you just, you know, you get all these fancy words in there. A person who is, not, is going to hold the strictest confidence and doesn't, isn't motivated by sharing salacious correspondence. There you go. Who's not horrified at the revealing of any sin, yet at the same time simply doesn't shrug off sin dismissively with an attitude, oh, well, it's not so bad. He's going to take sin seriously, but is also not going to treat your sin as though, <gasps> that kind of reaction. How do you find this person? Richard Foster gives three suggestions for finding this person. The first one is very simple and straightforward. Ask God to reveal them to you. Ask God to reveal that person to you. Pray. Pray beginning right now. Pray that God will reveal that person to you and keep praying each day until God brings a revelation of that answer and brings clarity for you. Ask God to reveal that person to you. Secondly, Observe people who evidence a lively faith in God's power to forgive. Ask yourself, how does this person deal with other people's sin? Uh, how do they uh, think about forgiveness? Do they think that there are limits to forgiveness? Uh, do, as you hear their speech, do you get this idea that somehow maybe there are certain people, and, and I don't know, you could kind of put, we'll put them in what I'll call the Hitler and Bin Laden category, right? Or whatever, fill in the blank, whatever the most egregious sin or the most egregious sinner you might think of in your mind, you put them in that category. And are they those kind of folks that say, you know what, well, forgiveness applies to these people, but I can't understand this, you know? Like, I can't understand how God would forgive this. That's not the kind of person that, that you want to be going to with your sin, with your personal life. That's not the kind of person who has that, that openness and understanding the fullness of God's forgiveness, so, so stay away from that person. Find the person who really has a lively faith in God's power to forgive. And thirdly, today, observe people who exhibit the joy of the Lord in their own heart. Find people who exhibit the joy of the Lord in their own heart. The bottom line is you're looking for a person who doesn't hold back when it comes to admitting the depth of their own sin because they know that that also reveals to them the depth of the love of God. The more in tune we are with the depth of our own sin, the more in tune we are with the depth of the love of God in our own life. And when we become in, in tune with the depth of the love of God, there's more joy that comes forth from us. That's where their joy comes from. They understand the depth of their need and thus the depth of the love of God. Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote this, 
Anybody who lives beneath the cross and has discerned in the cross of Jesus the utter wickedness of all men and of his own heart will find there is no sin that can ever be alien to him. Anybody who has once been horrified by the dreadfulness of his own sin that nailed Jesus to the cross will no longer be horrified by even the rankest sins of a brother. If we want to be the type of person who can speak life into another, first find your joy in the Lord by finally letting go of your own heart and letting Him walk through every room of it. No holds barred. Complete access. Let Him begin that journey of exploration with God. If on the other hand today, you need someone who will stand in Christ's stead for you to be able to vocalize and verbalize and act out the forgiveness that's already there, but for whatever reason there's a roadblock and you haven't been able to experience the peace that comes with what Christ has already done for you. If you're looking for that person who can stand in Christ's stead and help you achieve that peace and bring that peace into your life, it starts right here. It starts with that first step we talked about. It starts with prayer. Ask God to reveal them to you. That's where the journey begins. And that's where we want to actually end today, is with prayer. So let's go ahead and do that right now as we transition to this time of decision and the end of our service today. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your presence today, and we thank you for the gift of confession. For many of us, Lord, I hope today that that we do find peace when we simply have that conversation with you. Because Scripture is true. Forgiveness has already been decided as far as in Jesus Christ being made available to us. Forgiveness is there for us, for the taking. If we will accept Jesus Christ as our Savior, and if we know Jesus Christ as Savior, we're forgiven. But admittedly, Lord... There are times when, in, when it comes to being the hands and feet of Christ, we need others around us to come and basically affirm that truth. When it can be so valuable to hear someone speak to us, to our unique situation, after hearing the things that we're struggling with, after hearing the, 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 the wounds in our heart, so many self-inflicted. There's such, such value in having that person vocalize the truth that Christ has already established, to hear those words, to feel that empathy, to feel that forgiveness, the arm around the shoulder, or even if if it's not, if we can't do that in a socially distanced sense, like to feel that metaphorical arm around the shoulder, however we feel it, to have that person be the hands and feet of Christ to us in that moment of forgiveness. Lord, there's tremendous spiritual power in that. May we be people who seek to know the depth of our, own, of our own sin to the degree that we can understand the depth of the love of God to a degree that then we can have joy that makes us a draw. The people are drawn to us and, and they see us as a people where they, their hearts are going to be safe. And then they begin to reveal and they find that peace because of how you're using us with our humility, Lord. May we be those people. And today, if that's what we're seeking, may we find, if we find that person Father, we begin today to commit in prayer for your guidance, even right now in a time of social distance. Remember, we can't get together for coffee, but maybe we can get together on the phone. Maybe we can reach out through a Facebook message or an email or a text message. Help us to find that person, Lord, and experience the peace that you intend for us to be living in today. We thank you for the discipline and the practice of confession. We love you, Father, and we give you the praise and the glory in Jesus' name. Amen.
today, if you want to grow closer with the Lord, if you uh, want to continue to further that the relationship with Jesus, we talked about you know, growing in the depth of our understanding of His love for us. If you want to begin that journey, we'd love to hear from you. Message us. You might send us a private message through the Facebook page. Let us know, and we'll follow up with you and be glad to talk with you more about how we might be able to help you, even in the current circumstances, to begin making, taking steps to making that a reality, to growing closer to Him, even making that first decision uh, to follow Him in the waters of baptism and give your life to Him. We certainly uh, want to help you in that. And with any other decisions you may have or things you may be struggling with, be sure to message us privately again on the Facebook page or send us an email, office at nschristianchurch.org. We'd we'll be glad to follow up with you there. I uh, also want to mention as we close out our service, and we alluded to it earlier, we're aware of you know, so many of the winds of change happening in the public sphere right now in regards to what things can meet, what things can't meet. And for one, I just want to say we appreciate so much your patience with us as we determine what the best course is for Northside. I saw one of our sister churches post a response to this, and I think it's so true, and it really reflects, I think, our leadership standpoint at this time. Uh, we know there are a lot of people who think, man, church ought to be happening now, like the judge ruled this weekend, we you know, should be doing it now. Others who aren't ready uh, for that to come back. It's a, it's a mix of feeling about that in the church. Regardless of where you land on that, I just want to tell you what our perspective, I believe, in our leadership is, and that's this. Uh, we are not going to make a decision on anything un under pressure uh, where we have not had the, the adequate time where we feel to be able to pray and discuss and make the right decision uh, for our, our fellowship. And so we just ask that you would continue to trust us with that. We know we're eager, some is eager to get back, others a little more reluctant. Uh, what we want is simply, we're, what we're going to do, regardless of what the winds of other things are really saying, we're going to commit this and continue to commit, commit this to prayer as we have been and, and are going to uh, hopefully come to agreement uh, here or some sort of decision as to uh, a date for us to begin reopening uh, here in the very near future. And when, that, when we identify that date, uh, we will certainly communicate that to you and help you to understand a little bit of what to expect when you get here and when we're doing that. But right now, a date hasn't been set. Uh, we're going to continue, as we have been, to prayerfully uh, discuss that uh, and plan for that. There's a lot of plans that need to go into this and are going into this to prepare. So uh, we just we want to uh, share that with you today, okay? And we appreciate your patience. One thing you can't help us with, though, today in that whole discussion is there is a survey. Some of you saw it on Nick's notes this week a couple of times. Some of you saw it on our Facebook page. Uh, at the top of our, it's pinned now to the top of our Facebook feed. There's a link to a survey that we're asking everyone in the congregation to participate in. It's, gonna, it's helping us to understand basically who are the people who are ready to come back uh, and feel safe to come back. Who are the people, though, uh, that, that aren't? And that helps us plan for what kind of crowd, hopefully, to expect when we do all get together. I'd encourage you to see that part of our Facebook page. Uh, that, that survey will be live until 9 o'clock tonight. Uh, and so between now and 9 o'clock tonight, if you would, and if you haven't already, go fill out that survey. It's very quick. It's like a minute, two minutes tops it might take you to, to fill out. Fill that out. That gives us helpful information so that when we do reopen, we know what to plan for, who to plan for. And particularly, one of the things that's very important, uh, having uh, the volunteers we will need to pull it off uh, when that happens. And so if you would respond to that, we would greatly appreciate that. And uh, you all have been so wonderful. Honestly, our staff has said multiple times, and I think our leaders as well, this, we are blessed uh, with our congregation and the way that you have been supportive, the way that you have been encouraging, the way you've been praying, all of these things, we have felt that on our end. We love you all so much, and thank you uh, for, uh, for all of that from the bottom of our hearts. Let's go ahead now. Let's close our service with a word of prayer. And uh, again, we wish you all the best, particularly you moms out there uh, celebrating Mother's Day and however you're able to do that. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this time together. We thank you that we are uh, having this opportunity once again to share in this war time of worship. And now, Lord, uh, wherever we are, may your word encourage us. Uh, may it be a strengthening to us. Lord, uh, we pray for wisdom. Lord, give us all wisdom in whatever we're facing today. Father, give us wisdom as we try to figure out 
what it looks like to come back and, and to reopen and all these other things on, on our tables right now. Lord, uh, in the midst of all that, may what never changes be our love for you and our devotion to you and our attention to you. Father, we love you and we thank you for your grace. We thank you for Jesus. And it's in his wonderful, holy, precious name we pray. Amen.